Well, will you turn with me in your Bibles back to Luke's Gospel and back to that reading we had just a moment ago in Luke chapter 7. Now, from the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, there has been one dominant question. Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And so far in Luke's Gospel, we've seen that the prevailing thought from uh, the crowds who were watching him and listening to his teaching is that Jesus is nothing more than just a prophet. Uh, Now, uh, on, on the one hand, they were meaning something a little bit more significant than just uh, a messenger from God. They were talking uh, about the prophet who had been predicted by Moses in, uh, in, in the Old Testament, one who would come from among their brethren and be raised up to lead them, just as Moses had led them in, uh, out of Egypt, out of slavery, and to, to Mount Sinai. But Though some did mean that, others did simply mean he's merely a prophet. He's, he's someone who is speaking on behalf of God and doing uh, things uh, for God. God is using him. Uh, because like the prophets of old, Jesus had taught them about God's kingdom. And he had done so with tremendous authority. They continue to ask, who, who can this be? Isn't this Joseph, the, Nazare- the, 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 the carpenter's son uh, from Nazareth? Uh, they... they they, they couldn't quite get their heads around that this man taught with authority, unlike their scribes and unlike their religious teachers who uh, spent a long time quoting other religious teachers and their interpretations of the, the scriptures. Jesus didn't do that. He just simply said, I say to you, he taught with great authority. Uh, but also, uh, like the prophets of old, Jesus is teaching was accompanied by signs and wonders from God himself. They had witnessed him already cast out demons, heal the diseased, raise the dead back to life. They were amazed, they were thrilled, they were excited. Everything that they had heard, everything they had seen, made them conclude this man is a prophet of God. However, as we come to Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 35, their conclusion is about to be challenged and upended. At this time, while Jesus is moving around the uh, northern part of Galilee, he, there is a man sitting in a prison cell who had believed that Jesus was more than simply a prophet. And for the final time in Luke, we're going to meet John the Baptist as he asks an important question. And as his question is answered, we're going to see three things about him. We're going to consider this morning John's doubts, John's distinction, and John's detractors. John's doubts, John's distinction, and John's detractors. So firstly, we're told about John's doubts in verses 18 to 23. Now, what has just happened uh, as we begin verse 18? What has happened in the verses before? They're they're very significant. Jesus, after preaching his sermon on the plain, has uh, entered Capernaum, and there he has uh, healed the centurion servant who was uh, at the point of death at the centurion's request, and uh, he didn't even go to see him. He didn't need to go and touch him. He didn't need to, 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 to enter the centurion's house at all. The centurion said, I'm a man of, under authority and I have soldiers under my authority. I tell them to go and they go. I tell them to come and they come. I tell my servant to do this and he does it. Just say the word Jesus and my servant will be healed because I am unworthy for you to come under my house. And Jesus was amazed by his faith. He said he had not found such faith even in Israel. And that servant, he was, uh, he was in that very moment healed. And he was back to full health. But what else did we see? We saw in the afternoon last Sunday how Jesus, entering a place called Nain, saw this funeral procession leaving the city gates 
carrying the body of a young man who was the only son of a widow. And uh, Jesus, having compassion on this widow, reached out, touched the bier upon which he was being carried on, and he he, he raised that young man back to life and gave him back to his mother. And now the reports about Jesus are swelling. I mean, you would expect that, wouldn't you? Uh, I, I've, I've met a few people in, in my time in, in open, uh, when doing open-air evangelism who have claimed to be able to heal. and uh, Well, uh, there's not been much fanfare about them, which has made me kind of suspicious of actually their ability to do so. Because if someone does have the ability to heal in such incredible ways, then um, you would expect the, the news crews to be around them to, to be... Uh, verifying all of this and to be uh, and to be getting people excited about what's going on and that this is what's happening with Jesus that uh, throughout all of Judea and the surrounding area the people are, are, are beginning to talk and what are they saying they're saying a great prophet has arisen and in verse 18 we read that this report reaches the ears of John the Baptist sitting in the prison of Herod why is he in prison He is in prison because he dared to speak against Herod's sinful actions in stealing his uh, brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and marrying her while Philip was still alive. John the Baptist had come to him and he had dared to say to Herod, that is an unlawful thing to do. He opposed sexual immorality from the highest position. And the response of the highest position, the response of Herod, was not to repent as he should have done, not to go to John in the Jordan and be baptised in sign of repentance for his sin, but his response was to take John, imprison him, and eventually behead him. That's why John's in prison. And as he hears these reports, and being unable to visit Jesus for himself... He calls two of his disciples and he tells them to go to Jesus with a question. Notice the question, verse 18 to 20. The disciples of John reported all these things to him and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Now Luke isn't repeating those words uh, to simply be repetitive. You know, you may look at that and go, that's not great storytelling, Luke, uh, compared to our, our modern methods of storytelling. You've told us one thing, you it's, it's usually good grammatical rule not to repeat it again in the very next sentence. But what's Luke doing? Luke is n- not simply telling us a story. He is emphasising what we need to be looking at. And it's this question, the very important question on which this whole passage hinges. Are you, Jesus, the one who is to come or shall we look for another? You see, John had not spent his life proclaiming the coming of another prophet who would be like him. He was proclaiming someone who would be far greater than him. He hadn't uh, said to to the people who came out to be baptised by him in the River Jordan, he said, uh, don't worry folks, I've got my predecessor who lined up and he's just like me. John had been proclaiming... Folks, I, am, I, am, I, am, I have my predecessor lined up, and he is far greater than me. Here is one, John would say, who will pour out his spirit upon his people, and who will bring judgment upon the unrighteous. You don't like the way things are now. You don't like the evil things that are happening now. Well, don't worry. One is coming who's going to sort all of that out. But here is John. And he's locked up in prison by a sinful, unrighteous politician. And he's still waiting for God's judgment. He's still waiting for God to put things right. He's still waiting for Jesus 
to come with a threshing floor, fork and to sift out the grain. You can easily see how, Jesus, how, how John would have struggled with doubt. How easy it would have been for John to begin wondering whether he was right to point Jesus out from the crowd and say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You would understand why John might be worried that this Jesus who he said had come to judge is not the right one. That perhaps he's just a prophet after all. But notice the answer, verse 21 to 23. In that hour, he, that's Jesus, healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, uh, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus' answer does not, first and foremost, come verbally. Instead, he continues healing the crowds of their demons and their diseases, which include, specifically, and are highlighted by Luke, to be the blind. And after a while, you can imagine this took a while, he turns to the messengers of John and he says to them, go back to your teacher and tell him what you've seen what you've heard specifically tell him the blind see the deaf hear the lame walk the dead are raised and the gospel the good news or about the kingdom of god is preached to the poor why is this important? We'll come back to Luke chapter 4 and you find Jesus beginning his public ministry. He visits a synagogue on the Sabbath day and he has handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he reads from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Do you see what he's doing? He, by, by healing the sick, by casting out the demons, by putting special emphasis on giving sight to the blind, by preaching good news to the poor, he is saying to John, I am the one you have been expecting. I am the Messiah. I'm just not doing things the way you had expected. Because you say judgment should be now, but I'm telling you judgment comes later. Now is salvation. Now is the day of good things. Now is the day of God's favour. And don't be offended by me, but be blessed by believing in me. Now, now, what do we do with this? Because uh, there, there, are, there will be some people, and I think some people listening to my voice this morning, who are uncomfortable with the thought that John the Baptist, of all people, had doubts. There are a lot of commentators, Christian commentators, who don't like to, uh, to believe that John the Baptist had doubts. And so to get around the, what I believe is the natural reading of the text, which is that John had doubts while he was in prison about the person of Jesus and about whether he had uh, got his message right, is that they say, well, it isn't for John's benefit that he sent his disciples. It wasn't him who had the doubts. It was the disciples who had the doubts. And so John was sending the disciples so that they would see, so that they would hear and get the answer, so that they would know once John had got, has gone that uh, Jesus is the Messiah who they should be following. Now, you can take that uh, uh, reading if you like, but it, I just don't believe it's the most natural reading of the text and I would also say that it wrongly supposes that prophets should be immune to any imperfection, any fault, or any failing whatsoever. 
is a wrong assumption. Indeed, when Moses was called by God to go and face Pharaoh face to face and to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go and worship him in the wilderness, uh, Moses even got to a point of angering God because he doubted that God had the power to use him and to use his mouth that God himself had created in order to speak the truth to power. And you, you go through the rest of the prophets. We, we can, we, you, you just need to talk, maybe it would be a good exercise to talk about them over your dinner table or over, the, over a coffee at the end of this service. Uh, can you think of how other prophets failed? How other prophets went wrong? I'll give you one. Jonah. Here is a man who was disobedient to God, who ran away from his purposes, or at least tried to, and ended up being swallowed by a great fish in the ocean. And he had to be vomited out, yes I said, vomited out back on the land in order to actually make that journey to his enemies, the people of Nineveh, to preach judgment, knowing that God would uh, spare them if they turned to him in repentance. We mustn't make these false assumptions that the people of the Bible, that all of these, these prophets of the Bible, are somehow uh, immune from sin and immune from faults and immune from failings, that they were somehow superhuman, because they were not. And by the way, that's what other religions do to the prophets. They put the prophets on pedestals where they say that they were excused from sinfulness, that they were, uh, they were immune from faults and failings. And why do they do that? Well, because it, 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 it actually is designed to bring Jesus down onto the level of a prophet. Because Jesus alone in the scriptures is the only, he, he alone is sinless. He alone is the one who is without fault and without failing. And it's him we should listen to. It's him we should follow above anyone else. Why am I saying this? Because actually I think you're missing out on something if you, if you do, and I'm leading into this hard, because I think you're missing out on something if you try to excuse John the Baptist and you, you try to say, explain away his doubts. Because I believe the fact that John the Baptist did have doubts and he sought the reassurance of the Lord Jesus Christ is an encouragement to ordinary people like you and me. Because it teaches us that when we do have doubts and when we take those doubts to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will help us. And he, will, he, is, he is gentle and he will not rebuke us harshly for having doubts. But he will graciously reassure us and strengthen us in our faith. If you are having doubts this morning about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, my pastoral counsel to you is that you go and tell Jesus about those doubts. And see what answer he gives you from his word. Well, secondly then, uh, we're told, we've spent a long time on that one, but secondly, we're told about John's distinction in verses 24 to 28. You see, the, the dis disciples of John depart, and now the Lord takes the opportunity to uh, not talk to John, but to talk about John. Why does he do this? Well, perhaps he is concerned that the people would unfairly judge the prophet for doubting. And he wants them to know, without shadow of a doubt, the distinction or the honour that God has given him in his kingdom. And the Lord tells us and tells the crowd about the place John has among the prophets and also the place he has among the people. His place among the prophets... Look at verses 24 to 27. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. 
What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. What Jesus is saying there is he, 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 he's saying, look, listen, the, he, here is the true identity of John. Let me tell you what he is not. He is not a populist preacher who is aiming to scratch the ears or, and to scratch the itching ears of his listeners. He is not someone who can be blown about in the wind by every opinion, by every fad and every phase of popularism and, and so that he preaches what you want him to tell you. He wasn't that. He wasn't a weak man, pliable to the situation and the fads of the people. Nor is John a hypocrite, at telling people to repent of their greed while indulging in luxury. You might want to go back later to Luke chapter 3 and you'll uh, see John's instructions to soldiers and tax collectors and how each of those instructions was that they should not take more than what they were deserving of from the people. That they should be happy and content with the things that they have. And John wasn't there in the wilderness uh, standing on his pedestal telling the, these people ordinary people to, uh, to, to just be happy with the lot that they have in life while he himself lived it up in a king's palace. Of course, there's some irony going on there, isn't there? Because actually John is in the king's palace, although he's not sitting on a throne, he's sitting in a cell. So what did they go out to see? Not a populist, not a hypocrite, but a prophet. And Jesus adds more than a prophet. Because this is, this is the last of the Old Testament prophets before the promised one, before the Messiah, before the saviour of the world would come. This is the one who is not only a prophet but was prophesied in the Old Testament, specifically in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, where we're told, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. No other prophet had such privilege as John the Baptist did to be the one who would usher in and prepare the way for the coming and the dawning of the day of salvation through Jesus Christ. He, his place among the prophets is with great distinction. But look at his place among the people, verse 28. I tell you, among those born of women... None is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Don't you love how kingdom economics work? Do you know what I mean by that? Kingdom economics. If you don't know uh, kingdom economics, you need to learn kingdom economics. You don't need to take a university degree to learn them. You just need to listen to Jesus. You see, the world's economics work a little bit like this. If you're first place, you're the greatest. If you're last place, you're the least. The kingdom economics of God are this. If you hold first place, you're the least. And if you're last place, you're the first. Look what Jesus says. There is no one born among women who is greater than John the Baptist. No one with so much privilege, no one with so much responsibility placed upon them as John the Baptist did. And yet, says Jesus, since the Messiah has come, since the Saviour has arrived... Those who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John the Baptist. This is because they have a privilege that John never had for himself. 
and that is to live under the new era of God's grace in the new covenant purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, John never got to see Jesus sitting at the table with his disciples at that last meal, saying to them, as he blessed and broke the bread, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. John never got to hear Jesus sitting with his disciples as he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. He would never get to see the Lord Jesus Christ taken and crucified, dying for the sins of his people. And he would never experience the joy of Jesus risen from the dead and appearing to him after, after some days and ascending to his father's right hand. John wouldn't, uh, wouldn't experience the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost. John wouldn't have the privilege of preaching that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is Lord, and those who repent of their sins and believe in him will be saved. Oh, he got to preach part of it. He got to preach, he got to preach a shadow of it. But he didn't get to preach the reality of it. Dear believer, you are more privileged than John the Baptist, even if you feel you are the least of all people, because you have got to know and love and be able to articulate the gospel as it really is in Christ. Now, let me also say this. It should be a comfort to us that John's doubts did not disqualify him from a place among the prophets and among the people. Jesus didn't write him off. But Jesus was careful to speak well of him in front of the crowd who had heard his doubts. And doubting believer, be assured that your doubts do not disqualify you from membership in God's kingdom. Because your place is not in the kingdom of God is not dependent on the greatness of your faith or on the amount of service you give, the place that you have in the kingdom of God depends only upon the work and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who, by, who, uh, by who saved the lost in his death and in his resurrection uh, enabled the least to sit with him in glory. And as much as this was true for John the Baptist, this is true for anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, finally, we're told about John's detractors in verses 29 to 35. John's detractors. There seems to be a division in the crowd. Many of those who had been baptised by John, including the the tax collectors who were hated by the people rejoiced in God's work. But then there were the Pharisees. And not only the Pharisees, but the lawyers, they were people who studied the law of God and sought to apply it. They had refused John's baptism and what was John's baptism? What's the significance of being told that they, they refused John's baptism? Well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You see, the, the Pharisees and the lawyers falsely believed, like many religious people do today, that their religious activity meant that they had nothing to be repented of and that they were okay. You, that, that repentance thing, that 
believing in Jesus thing, that, uh, that, that actually admitting your wrong thing, that saying your sorry thing, well, that, that's, that's for people who, 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 you know, who have really messed up. That's for people who have really gone wrong in their lives. That's not for people like, who are religious and have it all together. That's not for people who go to church every week. That's what a Pharisee would say in 2024. You see, they, they, nothing to be repented of. And Luke tells us something that should sober any person trusting in religion and should strike, and I mean this, I'm not blaspheming, I mean this with sincerity, it should strike the fear of God in you, what Luke says here. Luke says that they were not rejecting John. They were rejecting the saving purposes of God in their lives. Do you know, it is an absolutely terrifying thing for me to stand up here and preach the gospel every week. And what terrifies me most is that there are people who come here every week who think that by coming here, by singing some religious songs, by enduring some religious prayers, and by sitting through a religious sermon, that they're all right. When the reality is, that you are rejecting the plans and purposes of God of salvation for your life. You are rejecting him. You are re- if you reject this gospel message, you are rejecting the God who will be your judge on, the, on, on that final day. And it scares me that even now, there will be people under the sound of my voice in this room who are just shrugging it off mentally. There is one saviour. There is one saviour of sinners. And if you reject him, you are choosing judgment for yourself. There is one saviour of sinners. So don't delay. But put your faith in him. And follow him as your Lord. Receive him and be blessed. Be part of his kingdom. Don't make the excuse of I'm too young. Don't make the excuse of, well, I, I really want to experience a bit more life. Don't make the the excuse of, uh, well, I I just don't have time for all of that. Don't even make the excuse of, I'm too old and set in my ways. But put your trust in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. Because because as we look at this division, as we look at the, the, the tax collectors in the crowd, the unlikelies, the undeserving the one who you wouldn't expect to trust in Jesus. They they do believe him, they rejoice in him, and they are saved by him. But those who are those who are religious, those who you would think would 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 accept Jesus, those who you think would uh, would would follow him, they don't. And they are condemned. You see, just, just focus for a moment on what, what Jesus does here. As he, because knowing what they are doing, knowing those who are responding, and knowing those who are rejecting him and rejecting John, he makes a comparison. Verse 30. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptised by him. Verse 31. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, we sang a dirge and you did not weep. 
You see, Jesus is essentially saying about the Pharisees, these very respectable, very self-important religious people, you're, you're no better, in fact, you're worse than children who are in the marketplace. Now, now, all of you have either had bored children in your home or you have once upon a time been a bored child. The chi- the, that, picture these children in the marketplace. They are bored. And they are doing what all bored children do. They are wanting someone to play a game with them. They are wanting someone to entertain them. They are wanting, looking for something to do. And you know how it goes. Whatever game is suggested to them, I don't want to play that game. Whatever activity is put in front of them, I don't want to do that. But you're bored. But I don't want to do that. You, you've been there? No, maybe it was just my childhood, because uh, I just know that was what I was like. Uh, I, know, I know that's what my nieces and nephews are like. This is what they're doing. This is what the Pharisees and the religious people were doing. Complaining of being bored, but rejecting any suggestion that will alleviate their boredom. They are childish. Now, why is he making this comparison? It's so he could make the criticism. Here's the criticism, verse 33 and 35. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. Here are the Pharisees. They claim they desire to see the nation of Israel characterized by holiness towards God. They want someone to come and sort it out. And when they see John abstaining from alcohol and from eating certain foods, what do they do? He has a demon! Okay? So they want someone who's going to come eating and drinking. Enter the Lord Jesus Christ, who goes to the house of Levi, the tax collector, and, and, uh, and ha- has a feast in his home, and the Pharisees are there, and they're watching on. And what do they do? Oh, he calls himself a holy man. He's eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's not holy enough. It's called a rock and a hard place. And it's often a deliberate trap of those who, are compli- uh, who, are, who have hardened their hearts against God. You can do nothing right. They are always finding fault and nothing you can do will ever satisfy their complaints. You don't know anyone like that, do you? But at the end of the day, Jesus says, they are more foolish than any child playing games in the marketplace saying, I'm bored. And they are more lost than they knew. Some of you tr- may treat church like this, by the way, uh, just, just to say. Some of you may say, well, I, I wish it was just a little bit more of this, and a little bit more of that happens. You say, well, I don't like that. I wish it was a little less like this, and a little less happens. You go, well, I didn't like that. So, some of you uh, visiting other churches, you don't like this, and you don't like that, and you go to another church, and they're doing something different, and you say, well, I don't like that, and so you never settle in any church. And God would say, you are disobeying his word, you should settle into a church and put your criticisms down and just seek the gospel where the gospel is being preached faithfully and truthfully. Stop being like the Pharisees, finding fault in everything, never being satisfied in your complaints. You're being childish. But I don't don't want to get there, I want to come back to this. I want you to notice there is an important distinction and difference between the doubter and the unbeliever. You see, the doubter is seeking to find questions about what they've already come to believe about Jesus Christ. 
the doubter will easily be reassured as the word of God is open to them and explained to them. The doubter is neither criticised nor condemned by the Lord Jesus Christ for having asked the question. But the unbeliever... The unbeliever isn't seeking to find questions, they're seeking to find fault with the Bible's claims and with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The unbeliever will not be easily reassured as the word of God is open. They will often be unsatisfied by any answer given and will simply move on to the next question. The unbeliever, who is obstinate in their unbelief, who is not willing to change in their unbelief, is both criticised and condemned by the Lord for asking questions disingenuously. You say, well, I'm open-minded. I believe it was G.K. Chesterton who said, the purpose of opening your mind is to close it on the truth. Perhaps you'll take a moment after the service to consider which of these you are. Someone who is doubting or in reality someone who is just unbelieving. As we close, John asks Jesus, are you the coming one or should we look for another? I hope you will see this morning that the good news is that Jesus is the one John had been looking for. Jesus is the saviour who had been promised ever since Adam and Eve first disobeyed God and were expelled from the garden. There's no need to look anywhere else. There's no one else who can forgive you your sins and who has accomplished salvation for his people. All you must do today is simply look to him and believe on him and you will be blessed with a place in his kingdom. For Jesus says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me.